Aloha and welcome to another edition of Condo Insider. Our show is every Thursday from 3 to 3.30 and focuses on association living in Hawaii. As I've said many times, about a third of our population lives in some form of an association which has its own rules and regulations. And our show is to help boards of directors and owners understand the obligations and requirements of living in an association. Thank God in about five days, our national election and local election will be over. I don't know if I can handle it anymore. I'm sure my wine bill has gone way up because it's driving me to drink, to be honest with you. That being said, what happens once the legislature, the election's over, is our legislature starts to get ready for its January start for the 2017 season. I found last year to be one of the toughest years for association management and that about 80 bills were introduced to affect association living. So I thought as a head start in this, I'd invite Chris Porter, who's the chairman of Community Association Institute Legislative Action Committee, who's the chair of the CAI LAC Committee here in Hawaii, to talk to him about what we might anticipate in 2017 before the legislature. So welcome to the show again, Chris. Thank you very much, Richard. So kind of as a review, why don't you just briefly tell everybody about your background and your firm and and what the CAI Legislative Action Committee is. Sure, um, I'm with uh, Porter McGuire, Keokon, and Chow. We're one of about four of the law firms that specialize in representing condos and HOAs. Um, I would say probably three years ago, I started to get involved with LAC. You had already been involved with LAC, and that's the Legislative Action Committee of Community Association Institute. Community Association Institute is really an organization that uh, supports community, uh, condominium and uh, homeowner associations throughout the United States and they have different legislative action committees throughout the US um, and in Hawaii there's actually a LAC that's a local chapter and they have a chair so I'm the I was the chair last year I'm gonna I'm, I assume I'm the chair this year but we try to switch it around uh, you're on the legislative action committee but it's really an organization that attempts to um, track the bills. Uh, we have a lobbyist and we try to track the bills up at the Hawaii State Legislature because uh, believe it or not, there's about 3,000 bills that pass through the legislature. So it's pretty difficult for us to track it. And so how does a person get on the Legislative Action Committee? Uh, is that yeah. mostly management companies and lawyers or who's the, who really are the members of the Legislative Action Committee? That's a, that's a good question. The uh, Legislative Action Committee is actually uh, made up of folks or representatives from all facets of the association industry or the community association industry. So you have owners, you have um, owners slash directors, you have managers, you have attorneys, you have insurance agents, so you have vendors from different parts of the industry. But you have to apply to be uh, become a member and then your name has to get vetted or goes to the national organization and then the national organization will approve you and then if there's an opening locally, then the local chapter is always looking for volunteers. And actually, we're always looking for volunteers because it takes a lot of time and effort to just be able to, you know, spend the time going down and waiting for the bills to come up uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. I think uh, CI LAC in Hawaii anyway is 12 members. Yes. Which is equally divided, three members from the vendors, three from the attorneys, three from the management companies, and three from the homeowners slash directors. So no one has a real monopoly or control of, of what's, being, what's being said. Correct. It, uh, that you've been on uh, Legislative Action Committee longer than I have, and your numbers are correct. And, and no particular body or representative group has a, a hold on the Legislative Action Committee or can outvote anybody. And actually with that type of a division, you have equal representation of all facets of the community association industry. So, Well, there's other lobbying groups like the Hawaii Council of Community yes. Associations. Mm -hmm. There's the Condominium Council of Maui. There's a couple of lawyers out there who do their own uh, lobbying and there's some private owner groups. Do you think it's a good thing if they work together before it goes to the legislature? I mean, uh, when I go in, uh, I know when the legislature is in session, it's almost impossible to get much time for the legislators. It's already kind of they're in a, in a in a game plan and it's rolling along pretty quickly, mm -hmm. and 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 to have all this conflicting testimony during the legislature pretty much stalls the bill out. 
because it, the legislators aren't experts in our area. They don't know what's really going on. So do you think it's an important thing that all these groups should try to work together and, and vet these things before it gets to uh, yeah. the bill state? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, th I, I think one of the issues that we've seen up there when both of you and I have been uh, testifying is that we do have, as you said, a couple of individual attorneys and we have these other groups that are up there and a lot of times we're not talking to each other um, as organizations and so this year uh, beginning last year we we're starting to make a more concerted effort to try to bring all of these groups together uh, so that we have one voice uh, and a lot of times we're on the same page we also have the national or one of the representatives of the national registered parliamentarians that testifies uh, so we have about five different groups we also have an individual homeowners group that has raised um, some complaints that they have with their particular boards and so they formed a different group it would be great if all of us could get together uh, talk about the issues and then go to the legislature with a, a common plan yeah my experience has been when you have competing groups with different points of view pretty much they all speak loudly before the legislature which pretty much stalls the bill because th th there's yeah. no consensus of how to make it better and there's just uh, there's always risk and reward and win and lose and good and bad, but if, if the legislator doesn't see, see consensus, they're more likely not to do anything. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, and I think the, it, all they're seeing is different facets of the industry arguing over a particular issue. And like, I mean, they have to deal with 3,000 bills. So imagine if they had that with every single bill, there's no way that those would function. And as one of the legislatures once told me if a, uh, a bill's like a shark if it doesn't keep moving it's going to die so it's got to keep moving through the different facets of the legislature otherwise it's not going to pass and the more i think fighting and the more uh, conflicting information that they get there's just no way that they're going to be able to make a decision and so it's going to die it's not going to keep advancing and there are things out there that are good for the industry and if we would all simply work together i think it would be great i would comment just for everybody who may have missed the show we were within the last couple of shows we had Alicia Malafiti on the mm. show who's our lobbyist and she talked about the process and the committees and the bills and how that works and so if you miss that show and you want to know how the legislature works you should go back to the Think Tech Hawaii website and pull up the interview with Alicia Malafiti who really went into okay. detail about the whole legislative and governmental process and, and how that all works to get a bill. Okay. But in my Tom Toms, in my, uh, of, of what we're hearing about from last year and this year, uh, let me just talk about, ask you a question about a couple of potential bills. I'm not saying they will be bills, but we're getting some Tom Toms already about things that may come up this year and kind of get your sense on them. Sure. The first thing was we've talked about one of the always the issues every year is you have a group of homeowners who are upset with their board of directors. And so they want to implement change mm. and they want to change the rules by by legislature and law one of the things that we advocated as an industry for was called act 187 which provides a form of evaluative mediation have you had experience <clears throat> with that has it been successful for you evaluative mediation is, has this been working and 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 where do you see we need to maybe amend that law i hear there'll be some potential amendments about that uh, how do you see that all shaking up the, uh, the Act 187 was probably covered on several uh, shows ago, too, in terms of the difference between evaluative mediation, which is the Act 187, versus the traditional mediation, which is more, I call it the Henry Kissinger approach, where I come to you and ask you what your position is, and then I run into the other room and ask the other person what their position is, and I go back and forth, but I never give you my opinion. Whereas with evaluative mediation, the mediator... Uh, which, which we've been able to get retired judges, um, people that are familiar with the industry, the association industry, they come in and actually will give you their judgment as to where they think it's going to go. So it helps parties focus and tries to get parties to understand that, hey, if you go fight this in court, you're probably not going to win or this is the, the way it's going to come out. So uh, the evalu value to mediation process has been a great process. It's paid for, again, through the real estate uh, fund and each party pays half of the first hour of the mediator's time. So it's only about 175 bucks each. So it's a great process, it's worked. Um, one of the problems that we have heard at the legislature, and I'm not saying that it's not a problem, is that in few circumstances, the owners have said, I want you to go to mediation, Richard Emery, and you're on the board of directors of Condo X. 
and the board says, well, we have this value to mediation process out there, but we're not going to go. And then the owner is stuck, and that owner is coming to the legislature now and telling the legislative body, or at least uh, the different committees, we, we, don't, we can't force them to go. What do we do? Uh, and that's where they're, that's the problem that they're raising before the legislature. And there is a way to get around it, but the legislature's reaction, um, and, and rightfully so, is that they're looking to these owners and saying, hey, you are lay people. They don't have attorneys. They don't know how to push the boards or the owners into court or into the mediation. Uh, and so what I, I've heard about it, I'm going to ask you the question, sure. is um, what is the proposed remedy to help facilitate that and make people show up for mediation? Oh. There's been some discussion. What, I know nothing's been agreed to by the committees, and, but there's been a lot of conversation over the last year about this. So what is one of the proposed thoughts on and what we might amend to make this uh, better? Um, the, at least from the association standpoint, because they have the ability to have counsel typically, somebody like us or another law firm, they can file uh, what's called a special proceeding with the court to force you as the owner into the mediation process if you're not going to go. So there is a way to do it. What the legislature is being told is that that's too much of a headache and that owners really don't know how to go through that process and so they want a different way of dealing with it. One of the ways that hasn't yet been discussed throughout the industry, but I've heard about it too, like you have, is that somebody has suggested, uh, or at least a group has suggested, possibly amending the current law so that if a party uh, asks for mediation through the evaluative mediation process, you get notice of it, and then you decide not to participate or not to show up, that you're giving an opportunity to understand that if you don't show up, the evaluative mediator will issue a written decision and that that decision may become uh, binding to some extent and then they have some type of a due process requirement built in. So there is some discussion about coming up with some penalty and I don't think it's been fully flushed out. It hasn't been uh, discussed at CAI's uh, Legislative Action Committee yet to get all of the industry input. But I think there's got to be some alternative given to the legislature. So, From, from your experience as a lawyer, you've done Act 187 and value of mediations. Yes. Have you found them successful for the most part? Oh yeah, yeah. I think they're. I think we probably have resolved. Uh, I would venture to guess 80 to 90 percent of the cases that we've submitted to the process. So I think it is a valuable process. Now, I've had, I've participated as a witness in one recently, and uh, okay. and I found it very helpful because these judges take the gloves off mm -hmm. on both sides yep. and and clearly tell them the strengths and weaknesses of their case and are pretty much able to even tell one side if they're wrong, they're wrong, and, and resolve the suit without getting legal fees and all the rest of the sunbug you get when you get into the legal process. Yeah. So what we're going to do is this is very entertaining. We're going to take a short break for one minute. We'll be right back with Chris Pointer. Thank you. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you very much. Well, we're back to Condo Insider talking about what we might anticipate for association legislation in 2017. And we're talking about Act 187 and solving owner disputes. And last year there, as a part of this mediation, there was a group trying to fight for what they call an ombudsman, mm -hmm. to have some state agency, in this case it was the Attorney General's office. They actually called it a condo czar in the meeting to kind of take responsibility for when homeowners have a dispute, they'd follow what the condos are. Is that something that's viable? 
It, it's uh, the actual uh, bill that was moving uh, throughout or through the legislature, and it did die because it didn't keep going. Uh, used the word condo czar, and it did create or attempt to create an office within the attorney general to basically give that particular condo czar a lot of power to resolve um, or at least get involved with a lot of association disputes. It basically, as we labeled it, it was an attack on self-governance because associations are supposed to be able to govern themselves like many uh, governments and they have the rules and regs to be able to do that. So the industry wasn't uh, in favor of it just because it was such a drastic change. It could lead to, to potential uh, constitutional fights, uh, lead to fights over whether it was legal under the governing documents of an association and could government impose these types of requirements. So I, I expect it to come up again, maybe in, in a different form or different fashion. But, and I think that again, it's potentially to address some of the issues that are being brought by owners that have concerns with their boards and they just don't know how to address those concerns. Because the concern I had is when you look at a, the, the association governing documents, it's really a contract between the owners and the association. And I can see where the government could force you to follow your contract, mm -hmm. but I don't think they could pass legislation to override your contract and, 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 and say, even though you have a contract, this is how it's going to work, we're going to give some person some omnipotent power to override however they feel that that'd be a constitutional issue to me yeah and, and that's th those are some of the issues that we raised and uh, that was one of the reasons I, I believe that it was defeated uh, I think that the legislature is still looking for some mechanism whether it's the ombudsman at a different level and I agree with you that I think all they could do is as an ombudsman or a czar is to suggest uh, amendments or changes but there were a lot of things that were in there that would uh, cross the line in my view but I think again I think the industry has to come together and go to the legislature or at least have something prepared to go to the to the legislature I think you would agree uh, to address these uh, pockets of concern you know I think we have to have a way and a, and a mechanism that's why I like Act 187 yeah. to solve these disputes but yeah. you know one of the issues that came up last year was term limits for example for board members mm -hmm. that comes up almost every year and my arguments always been look we have term limits. All you as the owner have to do is go get your owners to change your own governing documents to have term limits in your association. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they can't do that, so they seem to try to go around to the legislature to pass some law to affect everybody. You know, so it's, it's almost like they can't, there are processes within the governing documents to make changes, but because they can't get their homeowners to support it, they look for a law to change it because of their view and, and they're not getting what they want. So, And, and, and I think it is a, um, that there, no, I think all of us agree that there are pockets or minority pockets of potential problems just like there are in any community or industry. And there has to be some way to address those. But again, uh, the condos are is pretty drastic. I think some of these other methods are, are much more drastic. And I, and I believe that... Um, if we can amend or clean some way tighten up 187 like you're talking about to create a process that would force this mediation program and give it a chance because I think Senator Baker uh, who is one of the proponents of 187 I, I agree with her I think we really need to give this a chance but we need to come up with a way to force people into it without having to go to court to force them into it. Yeah, I agree. Because homeowners don't have the resources or the knowledge. And we need to yeah. find a way to amicably to solve these disputes when we can. Yeah. And that kind of brings me up to uh, another issue that uh, I saw the bill, uh, draft bill recently, where they were talking about uh, a topic I brought up in the show before, that owners have a right to participate in board meetings. Mm. And some boards have said, well, yeah. we let them speak at the forum. We're not going to let them speak during the meeting. And they say, well, we'd like to have you come to the executive session to discuss your private matter, maybe your delinquency, but you can't come to an executive session because the law says it's for board members only. So there, there's been discussion about cleaning up the language. To me, it doesn't change what the rights are, but have you heard about that and kind of what is the what are they trying to do on this amendment to uh, that particular section of the law with regard to homeowner participation well I, I, I think at least my personal opinion and again this is um, as an attorney if I was representing or when, when I do represent boards uh, and I work with uh, 
various associations and various management companies, I would tell the board of directors that they have to allow for the owners to participate in the regular session. Uh, there are ways in which to control it so that it doesn't totally disrupt the process and you can't get decisions made. So there are ways within the law to be able to do that. Um, I personally don't think it's right to keep owners to commenting just at the forum before or after. Um, but I have, I understand that some boards may have concerns that uh, they want owners to be able to attend and address particular issues in executive session. I think there's already a mechanism built into the law to do that. If it needs to be cleaned up, I think we can do that. But um, owners, if you have an grievance or you have an issue and we don't want to make it public to all of the owners, we, we can invite you into the executive session, have you give your piece, have the board ask you questions, and then when the board has to make its decision, they can excuse you from the executive session. But uh, I don't think we can build into the system allowing for owners at their choosing to attend executive sessions. Yeah, I agree. The way I look at this bill is, first of all, it's a perfect example of an owner who had an issue who came to the industry and were working with that owner to try to find ways to clean up the language. Oh, okay. It strictly is just cleaning up the language. It really isn't changing. But what you do is you get these volunteer board members who read it their way. And when you look at the very basis of it, where the law says may participate in deliberations, you know, so if you have a motion or something on the table outside of the forum, to me it's patently clear if you're a parliamentarian, that means an owner during the deliberative part of the, uh, the motion with, before they vote, an owner should be given a chance to say, I agree, disagree, or I recommend this, or, or recommend the following. And what this particular owner was saying is that it just needs to be clarified the language a little more clear so boards don't read into this in their, in their own interpretation and how they're going to prohibit owners from uh, speaking at board meetings. So I think this is an area where the industry, the trade organizations I've worked with, support the idea of clarifying the language. So it really doesn't change anything. It'll just make it more clear for voluntary board members to understand what owners' rights are at a board meeting without giving away the store and out losing control of the meeting. So I think it's pretty good. Yeah. An another one I've heard is, you know, we know there's 514, kind of in the Hawaii Revised Statute 514A and 514B. You know, and they're kind of the same in a way. They, you had 514A forever, and then 514B came along, which is a recodification, and now we have both. And there's some talk about repealing 514A. How do you feel about that, and what's the issues? I, I think the, um, right now, if you don't opt in, uh, or you're not one of the newer projects, then you can still be in this 514A, 514B land, as I call it. Um, you can opt into it, but um, some boards, uh, for different reasons, uh, think that it's going to give too much power to, um, or, or some owners think it's going to give too much power to boards, so there's a tendency in, in a minority set of cases to not vote to opt in. But what it's doing practically um, is that in fights or disputes between the association and owners or just the association and other groups, whether it's contractors or other things that come up because we are like a small government government within the community or condo industry, there are fights that come up and the other parties are using the language from 514A sometimes to contradict uh, 514B. So we've used it, we've seen it used as a tool against associations, which is not good. Um, I think, I personally believe that we should just have one law, which is 514B. I, be I believe that 514A and feel that 514A should be repealed. Uh, there's going to be some cleanup and language that has to be done to do it. Uh, I think within the industry of real estate attorneys that are doing these developments and just the industry in general, I think the support is moving in that direction. It just has to be done in the right way because I understand that there are still projects in the pipeline that were originally uh, created under 514A. So there has to be a way to allow those to get through the system, have 514A die, and uh, make sure that 514B covers whatever we need to cover from 514A. But again, it's, um, I, I really don't see the use of it anymore. Yeah, I kind of agree. I understand in the beginning why we had 514A and 514B, kind of like training wheels, give 514B a chance mm -hmm. to see what unintended consequences may come out of it or whatever. But when you start thinking about 514B, part five, which is condominium management, 
regardless whether you're an A or B, applies to everybody. Correct. There's a bunch of other sections that have this kind of gray area with, with regard to it. I think we're at a point in time in the industry where we don't really have any value having 514A and 514B anymore. All the issues have been cleaned up and through amendments and the law and changes. It's probably going to be easier for everybody if we don't have people going to both statutes and trying to find language to support their provision. That it's probably a time that uh, uh, we uh, recommend the 514A get appealed. But uh, I don't know how the legislature will react to that. It, I, I think it just depends on whether. If the entire industry supports it, then I think it, there's a good shot at doing it. Whether it's this session or next session, I think it's going to be coming up fairly quickly. Uh, I know Gordon Arakaki, who was one of the attorneys, I'm not sure if you've had him appear on the show, but uh, Gordon was uh, one of the instrumental uh, folks in the industry that worked on the recodification, and he is one of the proponents of trying to repeal 514A. So uh, he may be someone to talk to in the future in terms of the original goals, where he, he sees 514B has gone, and then where does he see the future of uh, uh, in the timing in terms of hopefully getting rid of 514A? Well, I know we're down to our last couple of minutes of the show, and I know last year we had priority of payment restrictions, licensing mm -hmm. of managing agents, board term limits, and in some cases they were looking at punitive measures if you didn't fund your reserves, that some third party is liable for uh, the additional cost. Do you think all that's going to come back up again? Yeah, it, it's, it's come up every year. Uh, term limits have come up almost every year. Uh, the licensing of managing agents has come up and there's just a number of problems and hurdles with those. Uh, the most recent one that I just heard about that I, we were discussing a couple of minutes before the show was the um, cap on attorney's fees uh, uh, to be capped when an attorney is trying to collect a debt for an association. What I, th I think the proponents don't understand is that associations, as you've educated me in the past, uh, operate on a zero-based budget, meaning that they don't operate to make money. They're basically operating to pay the bills, to pay the lights, pay for the sewer, pay to operate, pay to you know the reserves, and so there isn't any extra money. So whenever there's a delinquent owner, they're not anticipating attorney's fees, and so they have to recover all of those attorney's fees. There's an attempt I think uh, this next session, and I, I believe I've seen a draft of a bill to try to cap it. Well, thank you for being here today. Uh, I know it's going to be an interesting year this year yeah. in the 2017 legislature. I do want to thank the legislators. I know it's a very hard job yeah. with what they do and trying to sort out all the things that come before them every year. And I know that uh, they probably feel this way about all the people who testify that we're very biased on our opinion, which is true, I guess. But we want to thank the legislator. I want to thank you for being here today. And, uh, thank you, Richard. And, Good and, to see and, you again. Yeah.